<clears throat> Great. So before I do the introduction, um, uh, Paul, I'll just uh, go ahead and do a, a brief kind of a consent statement. Uh, uh, so if you if you just give your verbal assent in a in a second after I'm done, so. Uh, yes. Just that you agree that this interview in whole or in part um, will uh, come under the archival care of the Bronx County Archives at the Bronx County Historical Society, and that it can be used uh, by researchers, students, educators uh, for any kind of um, uh, educational research or nonprofit purposes. Uh, I agree that my interview can be used by the Bronx Historical Society for uh, for all of its educational purposes. Please forgive me for not detailing them all, but yes, I agree with this statement. Okay, great, great, great. Now we can get into the, into, uh, the nitty gritty. So welcome to the Bronx Latino History Project. My name is Stephen Payne, librarian and archivist at the Bronx County Historical Society. Today's February 1st, 2022. Uh, it's crazy to be saying that year. Um, and I'm happy to be here with Paul Mondesir, the son of Elba Cabrera. Uh, we've already done some oral histories, uh, multiple parts with, um, uh, with Paul's mother, and the nephew of Lillian Lopez and Dr. Evelina Antonetti, um, some really, really spectacular uh, Bronx women that have left their mark in a lot of, lot of different ways. Um, and Paul himself is a very proud Bronxite. I believe he uh, has a hat that he'll probably show off. At, at he has a hat that he will show off. <laughs> there we go. Born in the, in the, Bron the Born in the Bronx logo uh, <laughs> was created for my cousin Joe Conzo Jr., uh, grandson of uh, Dr. Evelina Antonetti, and grandnephew, for that matter, of Lillian no Lopez. Uh, and uh, the Born in the Bronx is uh, related very specifically to the birth of hip hop in the Bronx, and Joey was the primary documentarian of uh, of that era here. Absolutely, amazing, amazing uh, photographs, uh, um, and uh, actually through the Bronx African American History Project, this would have been like 15 years ago. Uh, he did an oral history through that. I'm probably gonna I'm probably gonna do a follow up one um, as well to hit on anything he didn't didn't hit on there, but. Um, but yeah, really amazing family, a lot of legacy, a lot of Bronx legacy in this family. And um, Paul himself, of course, uh, years of experience in the broadcast nonprofit industries and, and, uh, and in a relatively new thing from what I understand as far as um, uh, e-scooters go. Um, yes, I'm in the, in the nascent micromobility field. Uh, the field is uh, roughly speaking five years old. Uh, and uh, so is my younger daughter. Uh, interestingly enough, the company line that I used to work for and actually is operating its e-scooters in the Bronx. Well, that company was founded approximately three weeks before my younger daughter was born. So the entire sector is a baby or actually now it's uh, technically, I guess it's entering pre-K. <laughs> wow, wow, that's, that's wild, that's wild. Uh, so, so yeah, I'm sure, Paul, I'm sure you're gonna get into uh, everything that we've already touched on a lot more yourself, um, but let's let's start off uh, kind of at the beginning, or at least what you what you know um, as the beginning. Why don't you tell a, us a little bit about your family's history and background, and how they ended up in the Bronx, at least as much as you know. Sure. Um, well, I can start with my pops. Um, uh, Dad uh, was born in Dominica in the West Indies, not the Dominican Republic. Sure, sure. <clears throat> Pardon me. And uh, he and his family came here to the States. Uh, Dad was born in 1931, and I believe that he came to the States when he was about eight years old or so. Okay, sure. Yeah, I, I'm, please forgive if I don't have the exact dates on that. That's fine. Uh, he, my mom was born in, in uh, Ponce, Puerto Rico in 1933, which I guess you have through the archives. Um, uh, fast forwarding a little bit, my parents, uh, frankly, quite legendarily, met at uh, at the Palladium, yeah. uh, the original Palladium, not the joint on 14th Street, uh, <laughs> and uh, they met when when Tito Puente was performing, and apparently my father spotted my mom coming across the, in 
you know, when she came in, made the beeline across to introduce himself, asked her to dance, and uh, shall we say the rest is history as far as that's concerned. Absolutely. Uh, dad, it, my dad grew up in Harlem. Uh, my grandparents actually lived on the 129th Street between uh, Madison and Fifth, as I recall. Uh, Madison, no, no, it would be uh, Madison and Lex because it was like right off of the uh, off of the bridge. Okay, sure. And uh, mom had grown up in El Barrio, uh, but uh, later moved to the Bronx. And my dad moved to the Bronx because that's where mom was, basically. Uh, sure, sure. You, you, you follow your heart in love. Um, we we lived. Okay, so. Um, my parents moved into Gun Hill Projects, NYCHA housing, uh, in 1957, I believe it was. Uh, my brother at that point was about two years old, give or take. Um, and then when I came into the world in 1960, uh, my parents were able to move from a smaller one-bedroom apartment into a two-bedroom apartment uh, for us. And that was at uh, 735 Magenta Street. <laughs> <laughs> uh, apartment 12b that was the building with the water tower uh, on the top for whatever that's worth <laughs> a corner of magenta and holland avenue right across the street from immaculate conception church sure. um we lived there uh until uh 1969 when we moved to co-op city uh my family was one of the first uh you know one of the shucks, we were one of the first families in Co-op City, period. Uh, we, I do recall actually going to the first meeting uh, downtown uh, in Chelsea, actually, uh, when they were announcing that Co-op City was going to be built. Uh, this was, I believe, in 1967, the beginning of 1967. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that was actually pretty neat. Um, and we moved to Co-op City. Uh, when it opened, we were in building three. Uh, ours was the fifth building to open up and co-op. And quite frankly, when when we moved in, there was nothing but sand all around. I'm sure. uh, there were five buildings open. Uh, the supermarket was in uh, the garage in section one. Uh, and there was the skeletons for uh, buildings six, seven, and eight. But the rest of co-op was literally swamped. There was nothing else. Or landfill, excuse me. It was not, it was landfill. Yeah. Um, let me, so let me pause there. I'm just trying to like, tell me, you tell me what other information that you need and excuse sure. me, happy to provide. Sure, yeah. So what, what, what are some of the memories you have of uh, the Gun Hill houses? You know, I'm really glad that you asked me that. Um, so growing up in the 60s was a very interesting time because of the nature of the, the nature of the world. Right. And Gun Hill Projects at that time of the public housing facilities in the Bronx was really unique because it was highly mixed. Uh, Gun Hill Projects had, uh, you know, African-Americans, as we would define it today, although everybody was just Negroes then. Um, we had African-Americans, we had West Indian Americans, we had Puerto Ricans, we had uh, Italians, Jews, Irish, all lumped into the projects. Yeah. Um, that was not the case for all of the projects. I mean, I know this because when I was growing up, it was like if you went to East Chester or Edenwall, it was basically all black. Yeah. You know, there just was there was not that mix. Absolutely. And in fact, the, the the civil servants that lived in our projects, uh, those were the folks that uh, that actually introduced us to Co-op City. That's how we got it. I see Elba, then I mentioned that. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah we, we had, because of the mix mix of folks that were living in co-ops, excuse me, in in, uh, in Gun Hill Projects, uh, we, we just had everybody there. And if I recall correctly, uh, there were two of my core best friends that heard about it first. Uh, it was the Sablowitzes, that would be Irvin and Elaine Sablowitz, who were... Uh, uh, Irv was a teacher. Elaine was mostly a stay-at-home mom, though eventually I believe that she uh, uh, got into nursing. And uh, my friend Joey Levine, uh, his dad was a firefighter. Uh, at a time, uh, he was a Jewish fighter, fighter when the when the FDNY was almost totally Irish and was totally racist. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, That's just true. totally. This is not this is not hyperbole. Uh, in fact, his father, you know, told me when I was a kid, no, you should not become a firefighter. And he was yeah. really, really clear. I was shocked because everybody was like, oh, yeah, well, be a fireman. <laughs> Erwin was like, nope, yeah, <laughs> don't yeah, even yeah. think about it. Wow. Um, so um, with that, uh, Gun Hill Projects was really unique. Um, because of that, the uh, the uh, demographics, also the location, of course, you know, it was right right off of the L, you know, the <laughs> elevated line. Uh, shucks, the, the Third Avenue L still actually was functioning, at least from Gun Hill Road to 149th Street in, in those days. I see, I see, yeah. Um, and what I remember the most about Gun Hill Projects then uh uh, you know, beyond the, the, the diversity was that uh, it, was it was a nice place to live, <laughs> you know. Um, there are a couple of things that uh, were interesting. So, for example, you know, when I was a kid, you know, we could basically, like, we could go outside to play, sure. right? You know, if, uh, when I was, like, you know, four, five, six years old, if my friends, you know, said, you know, uh, you know can Paul come down? It was like, yes, you know, I, I had permission to go downstairs, as long as I didn't cross the street or if I, you know, if I was going downstairs and we wanted to go to the playground across the street, it was like, mommy, I'm going across the street to the playground. No, we didn't have any cell phones. That was like a dream from, and that was even pre Star Trek. So you wouldn't even dream of having like a, a you know, a communicator or anything like that. But, but I know one thing that, that subbed in for it. Your, your mom told me she had a whistle. A That's correct. Their whistle. That That's right. <laughs> now my mom's whistle was not loud. But it was a, a certain frequency. And even though we were on the 12th floor, you know, I could hear my mom whistle when it was time. My friends could hear my mom whistle when it was time. And if they heard her whistle, it's like, Paul, you got to go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and interestingly enough, uh, my friend Joey lived in the next building um, on Holland Avenue. And his parents had a little bell. So if we had that little bell, Joey, you got to go. It's piano lessons or time for dinner. You know? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was very real. Um, we had a very, you know, it was a very pleasant upbringing. Uh, there were there challenges? Absolutely. You know, I mentioned that I was allowed to like go out and play, right? Sure. Um, but there were limitations to that. As I got a little bit older and I was in, in, uh, in elementary school, you know, I could venture further afield. Yeah. But you know, I could go, yes, I was allowed to go as far uh, as Burke Avenue. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, I was eventually allowed to go as far as Allerton Avenue. But I was never allowed to go beyond Allerton Avenue because beyond that was the Pelham neighborhood that was Italian. And if you were black and went there, you, would, you were looking for a fight. Yeah, absolutely. That's just the way it was. We didn't argue about it, but like, you know, Columbus High School? No, I never even looked at Columbus High School when I was a kid. I never even, I couldn't tell you where it was because it was in the, you know, it was the other side of the DMZ. Yeah. And for I, young I people, that's the demilitarized know. zone from the days of the Vietnam War. Um, <laughs> so what's important, there's a couple of things that are important about this. One is uh, a lot of the socio socioeconomic pathologies that we see today uh, didn't really exist there because the economic stratification of the nation's economy had not really hit as badly as it is today. Yeah. Right. Because I, again, when I was living in the projects, there was a lot of public servants living in the, in the projects. This wasn't, you know, simply people that could not afford to live anywhere else. It was like, look. This is this housing was built for people, and if, and if I remember the intent, it was never a place that was supposed to be your permanent home. It was a place that you were like you live there until you can you know afford to live somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. But that's also at a time, and you know, the, well, I'm sure we'll get into more of this detail later. But you know, this was also a time uh, when you know before Co-op City when everybody kind of lived spread across the borough when co-op city was built and we you know, listen we were, my parents and us we were you know we were naive to an extent we didn't understand you know what uh, what the ramifications were of co-op city being built yeah 
you know, uh, the Cross Bronx Expressway and the Bruckner were all being built, roughly speaking, when I was growing up. So, you know, I don't have a lot of memories of the actual, uh, the neighborhoods from before then, but I do know this for a fact. Uh, the establishment of Co-op City uh, devastated the Bronx because the working class, the middle class, the, you know, the Jewish population, frankly, and the union population all moved to Co-op City. That sucked all of the money and political power out of the South Bronx. And then it was on yeah. because of redlining and all of that. Uh, all of the horrendous pathologies that followed are directly related. And I don't blame anybody that moved to co to Co-op City because, you know, at the time it was like, look, this is, you know, it's a wonderful thing, but it played a tremendously negative role in the de-evolution of the Bronx. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I, I want to pause there because there's a, there's multiple layers that uh, that I could speak to, but I want to pause there and and uh, have you, if you would be so kind, tighten up the questions or ask a question to, you know, give me some guidance. Yeah, absolutely. So let's let's keep with um with Gun Hill projects for a little bit. Um, why don't you describe uh, some of the things that you would do for fun? You know, in near the building at first, of course, when you're younger, and then increasingly, uh, you know, a little further away from. Um, the, the, you know, complex as you got a little older. Yeah, sure. I mean, <laughs> we did what kids do. You know, we, we ran around, we played uh, to an extent cowboys and Indians and cops and robbers. And we had cap guns in those days because, you know, this was the 60s. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> you know, it just, this is what you did. Um, interestingly enough, uh, we rarely ventured north of the projects. You know, I went to PS41, which was on uh, Olinville Avenue down the hill a few blocks from our house. Yeah. Um, most of our activities uh, were basically from, from Gun Hill Road south. Uh, and, you know, with that demarcation line, as I spoke of the, before being Allerton, uh, going north of there further into the uh, Williamsbridge section, we didn't really do too much unless we were like right along the, uh, the subway line. So uh, Charlie Mowley Butchers, who were, I guess, two or so blocks uh, up uh, White Plains Road. Uh, there was Frank's Pizza at 219th Street. That was probably about as far as, you know, we would venture. Uh, that's a place where I had my first calzone. Oh, my God. Um, and uh, in terms of the stuff that we did, I mean, like, we just, we played, we played tag, you know, there was uh, football, basketball and things like that when I was a little bit older, but yeah. most of it was just like running around and, you know, trying not to get in big trouble or get hurt. Sure, um, sure. You know, uh, it was a time where parents weren't as worried about their kids because not that bad things didn't happen, but there was definitely a, a much greater sense of community. Uh, there was no question that if you did something stupid out in the street, your parents were going to hear it before you got home. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. And don't you be lying about what happened because they're going to know already. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> you know, um, other things uh, during the winter, we used to go uh, down to what was then called Bond Bread Hill, which is it. Frankly, it's a very small slope right next to what was the Bond Bread factory then. Um, but we used to go down there to go uh, to go sled riding. We would go to Bronx Park sometimes, uh, but Bronx Park was not what it is now. You know, you know, they didn't really give a excuse me, they didn't give a darn <laughs> about the parks or the people in, in a lot of the uh, a lot of the Bronx. Um, let me see what else. Uh, I went to uh, day camp at two places. I went to. Uh, 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 Mashalu Day Camp or Mashula. <laughs> I, we said Mashalu, although technically it's supposed to be Mashula. Uh, go figure. Um, also went to Bronx House for Day Camp uh, later on. Sure. Uh, that was on, again, you know, uh, Bronx House was on Pelham Parkway. And so that was, you know, by the time I got to go to go there, uh, I was a little bit older. I'm trying to think. I think they picked up, picked us up in a bus. Okay. I, don't think, I don't think we walked there. I think there was a bus that picked us up kind of thing. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, you know, most of the stuff that we did was just like what kids do, you know, sure. you know, sure. uh, it was, uh, listen, we didn't have white picket fences, right? Uh, you know, that was the stuff that was on Leave it to Beaver and that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I can recall, I, this is a silly thing, but yeah, I can recall, you know, uh, my first couple of Christmases, I guess I must have been maybe about four, probably about my daughter's age now, actually, when I think about it. Um, but I asked my parents, how in the world did Santa Claus get to us because we had a chimney in our building, but it was attached to the incinerator because we still burned garbage then. And so I was like, okay, I get the Santa Claus thing, but how does he get out of this chimney and through that drawer that we have put our garbage down through? And my parents, I remember my father looking at me and he just said magic and moved on. You know, and I, and, but when you're a kid, it's like, dad said magic, Santa Claus, magic, you know, reindeers and sh stuff. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> that's true. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I literally did ask that question. Um, let me see what else. <sighs> a couple of brief details uh, about our place. So my, my, my room with my brother, this is a, a weird detail, but like you don't think about, you know, poor construction or anything like that, uh, you know, in general when you're a kid. But our bedroom was right next to the, the bathroom and the wall by my bed was constantly, the, the, the paint was peeling because of wetness behind the wall, sure. right? And this was an era when they were still using lead paint. I remember the lead paint era and being told, don't eat the paint chips. And I was like, what am I, stupid? <laughs> So why am I going to eat paint chips? I mean, I'm, no, and I mean, really seriously. I mean, you know, I, I joke about that now, but this was a very serious issue. Um, and, you know, the projects at that time were fairly well kept. Uh, and in comparison to today, forget about it. Well, first of all, the housing stock was, you know, much, much newer. It's not, it wasn't like, you know, 40, 50 years old at that point. It's like maybe, you know, 10 or 15, yeah. right? So, you know, th those, uh, those construction challenges were, were kind of built in because people, you know, the contractors didn't give a damn, I, I suspect, but, you know, I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, back to doing some, I'm trying to think of this. I learned to ride a bike, excuse me, learned to ride a bicycle in the Vander Field, uh, which at that time was, uh, you know, didn't have any of that artificial turf. It was, it was dirt okay. and a fair amount of broken glass to... Uh, <laughs> I learned on a big red truck bike with a blue banana seat that my, and a sissy bar that my dad bought for me because we couldn't afford the fancy 10 speed. Uh, but I convinced them to, <laughs> I convinced my dad to put this giant banana seat, which is the kind of thing that they had on the, uh, on, you know, the fancy bikes. Sure, uh, sure. This is just, I can't believe this, but dad did it. <laughs> uh, what else? Um, we had the playground across the street, you know, that Gun Hill playground is still oh, there, obviously. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. And uh, actually the, uh, the old timers basketball game was founded by my peers. Oh. Is, is it, you know, uh, Charlie Horn, Anthony Horn, uh, who goes by the name of Charlie Rock through his, uh, his hip hop days. Sure. Uh, and he was part of the Black Spades. Uh, that was that was uh, after I moved out, and this was you know this was an era you know the that gang era. Just a, a quick aside, that gang era uh, de developed roughly speaking this in the seventies, not in the sixties. So we didn't have you know the Black Spades and the Savage Skulls and yeah. you know the Decepticons or the Jolly Stompers or the Oh, there's a couple other names that uh, that come to mind. We didn't have that stuff, you know. If there there may have been na neighborhood fights, uh, I knew for sure that the kids in my neighborhood we would fight with the kids from Edenwall or the kids from from Eastchester, sure. uh, or even uh, to a lesser extent Parkside. But uh, Parkside was in the 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 Italian neighborhood, so we didn't we didn't go over there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I. I I've done I've done some oral histories, you know, with with people who either lived in Parkside or in a building right next to Parkside called the Coops. Um, some of the first black families I'm sure to be in that neighborhood, and 
I've heard some, you know, crazy and terrible stories. Oh man, oh, look, I, I told you, we, we weren't allowed to go. I never set a foot past the, the south side of Allerton Avenue. Yeah, yeah. You know, we used to go shopping uh, on occasion. There was, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember the name of the supermarket over there. It was, we would drive there periodically. Um, Is it an A&P? No, it wasn't A&P. It was a local place, oh, okay. something with a D, I think. But anyway, the, the, the point is that, uh, yeah, if we went over there, it was, you know, like dad took us in the car to go shopping there and then we left, yeah. right? Yeah. And, uh, and that was that. Um, no other particular memories of like things that we would do other than, you know, like just like normal kid stuff, I suppose. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and, you know, this, this next question could get into your time at Co-op City too, um, but it's in general about uh, growing up. What are some of the foods that you remember eating on a regular basis while growing up? Uh, in the house or outside? Both. Let's do both. Yeah. Okay. Um, pretty traditional uh, Latina fare in the house. Sure. Um, you know, mom, mom still makes the best black beans. She makes the best arroz con gandules, uh, uh, arroz con gandules, rice and pigeon peas, sure, sure. Um, uh, which is now in my house known as tata rice because my daughter <laughs> likes her, her, uh, my mom's rice. And uh, a quick aside there, my mother will not eat my rice. <laughs> if I make rice, my mom is like, uh, 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 it's okay. I mean, I cook and I'm, I'm a good cook at this point. Mom will not mess with my food, uh, excuse me, with my rice. She'll eat yeah. anything else that I make, but not my rice. Anyway, um, in the house, uh, you know, fairly traditional fare. That way we did not eat a lot of steak uh, sure. in our house. You know, I, you know, and now I understand that to be based on economics. Um, but uh, a lot of fried chicken, um, not a lot of vegetables because in those days, uh, vegetables were boiled to death instead of uh, stir fried or steamed and oh god that's disgusting i didn't start eating broccoli until i was in college literally sure. <laughs> yeah boiled broccoli um, is the worst. oh man and, and and anything else and uh what else i never ate mashed potatoes still hate mashed potatoes it's in my baby book does not like mashed potatoes my mom would appreciate that i mean saying that <laughs> um uh outside you know listen pizza I remember pizza being 20 cents a slice. My brother remembers 15. I think he remembers 10 or 15 cents. I remember 20 cents a slice. And I remember that for most of my life, until the, until the subway fares hit 250, uh, the a slice of pizza was pegged to the cost of the fare. Yeah. So, you know, it was 20 cents a slice. Then it was, uh, when we moved to co-op, it was 25 cents a slice. Okay, I see. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. Uh, and then thirty at uh, in at Capri Pizza in in, uh, in co op because they could because <laughs> they, they had a monopoly. They're like, yeah, thirty cents. What are you gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> um, let me. I see. got a slice from there after one of the sessions. Uh, I I recording sessions with your mom actually. So <laughs> yeah, that's uh, well. Technically, that's Capri too. Capri the original too. owner yeah. sold the place god i think they probably only had like maybe three owners of capri but uh yeah the original owners were there they sold to another guy and then he sold to the guys that are there now the guys that are there now they're at least since 2004 when my uh, first marriage broke up so you know those guys uh, i i like I, I love those guys um yeah. anyway um but back to uh foods yeah you know uh oh a good bagel please I'm a very serious about my bagels. We used to, the bagels we would get from a uh, bagel shop on uh, Mashula Parkway and Jerome. I can't remember the name of the shop, but they were really, really good. They were like old school. And, and the guys that, uh, interesting, uh, the first owners, of course, were Jewish, but they taught the Puerto Ricans how to make those bagels. And when the Jewish guys sold, they sold to the Puerto Ricans, and that place stayed open for probably another 20 years before that closed. Oh, wow. Um, let me see. Uh, going out for a night on the town uh, meant going up to Jerome Avenue, um, as opposed to going to, uh, to like Pelham Parkway, because Pelham Parkway has a little stretch of restaurants uh, just south of, uh, of, of there on White Plains. We never went over there. 
Sure. We would, we would go up to, we would go up to uh, Jerome. Uh, there was a Chinese place called the Jade Garden, as I recall. Mm. And the food there was great. A um, couple of, uh, let me, I'm trying to think if there's any other uh, places that we went up to, uh, to eat up there. Um, not off the top of my head. We didn't, you know, the, the West Indian population that moved into the Williamsburg area didn't really move in until after Co-op City was open. Sure, sure. So, you know, basically the, the, the ethnic foods up there were, uh, were, it was Italian and Jewish, uh, the Irish bars and stuff like that. Well, the Irish weren't cooking very, <laughs> very well, okay? <laughs> they were really good at beer and whiskey, but the food, no, nah, man. Cabbage. And <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, I wasn't messing with that. But we had great Italian food and great Jewish food and good Chinese when we went up to Jerome Avenue. Um, and, oh, and we had a couple of good, a uh, couple of good bakeries. Oh, God, I wish I could remember the names. There was a couple of bakeries on... Uh, on Gun Hill that we would go to, and there was a few. There was a couple of pizza shops. I always went to a pizza shop when I was on Burke Avenue. There was a place that used to make what they called pizza burgers. Huh. That's when I was a little bit older. But basically, it was a it was a slice of pizza that they took two of them you know, cheap frozen patties. They 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 fry those up and slap them on your pizza. That was a big that oh that was mighty fine eating when I was a kid, man. You know, that's what we used to, me and my friends used to go there for lunch, you know, when, uh, I guess that would be when I was like maybe fourth grade or so, something like that. <laughs> I'm um, good, yeah. <laughs> and uh, any other food things? Um, not that I can think of off the top of my head. Sure. Did, did your father ever cook anything? Nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, my dad, my my dad's joke was that his uh, that my aunt Dorothy may, may they both read, rest in peace, but he used to say that Aunt Dorothy could burn water, but my dad never said that he never got into the kitchen. Okay, <laughs> yeah. no, the 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 kitchen was mom's domain. Dad was a fairly traditional male of his time. He wasn't doing any of that domestic stuff. Okay. You know, according to my mom, he never changed a diaper, which is something to me that's just like, really, how did you let him get away with that shit, huh? <laughs> <laughs> You know, and, that, and I'm the father of two daughters, and I'm just like, yeah, I, I, I couldn't get away with that. Yeah, um, yeah. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, so no, dad did not cook. That was just that was just mom. And what about your dad's family? Did you all get together with your dad's family? I've oh yeah, heard. yeah. We we used to we used to go visit uh, we used to go visit family a fair a fair amount. There was uh, my uncle Eddie lived out in uh, Jamaica Queens, and so we would. Uh, go visit Uncle Uncle Eddie and my Aunt Louise and my Uncle Irving out there. Um, and my grandparents lived, uh, I mentioned before, on 129th Street. So we'd go visit, <clears throat> excuse me, go visit them. And uh, my Aunt Dorothy and Uncle Ray lived down in Pennsylvania. They lived uh, first in a place called Concord Village, which is <laughs> a quick aside here. Uh, Concord Village was built uh, by what we would now call progressives as the uh, antidote to Levittown. It uh, was, uh, it was a, uh, a community that was designed to be an integrated community where everybody could move in as opposed to the Levittowns, which precluded uh, Korean War vets like my dad from moving in, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so that, that was actually pretty cool. Um, but yeah, we would visit family a, a fair amount. My dad, uh, I'm a car guy because of my dad, we, our, our first car in the family was a 1959 Volvo 544, um, which, you know, in those days, it sort of looked like, uh, it sort of looked like a Volkswagen bug kind of like that had like either on steroids or had some kind of, uh, had an accident with another car. <laughs> But uh, no, that car was, it was a great car and Volvo was the first company to retrofit rear seat seat belts. Uh. And when my father had them installed and he did, uh, our neighbors were like, seat belts in the back seat? Why would you do that? <laughs> uh, but no. this is the way it was. I oh, mean, for sure. yeah. <laughs> it was kind of lazy fair. It's like, yeah, okay. You know, um, let me see. Um, other stuff. Uh, ask me another question because I'll, I'll. Yeah, drift. sure, sure. So, um, 
why don't you talk a little bit about visiting uh, visiting your mom's family? Sure. So the anchor of our family uh, was uh, Titi. Uh, everybody called her Titi. That would be Dr. Evelina Antonetti. Sure. Um, Titi and her family, when I was really, really, really young, they lived, uh, I think it was, they were on Jackson Avenue. The address I'm remembering is 625 Jackson Avenue. Um, but we used to go visit them all the time. We used to visit uh, Aunt Lily a lot. She and she and my grandmother lived uh, in the then new um, Bridge Apartments. They were at uh, 111 Wadsworth uh, in Man. You know, uh, technically that's Washington Heights. Sure. The sure. Bridge Apartments at that time were brand brand new. Uh, they this was before they kind of turned into a sewer. <laughs> Yeah. You know, because that, that turned into a very harsh neighborhood. Uh, but Aunt Lily moved out of there before then. Uh, but we, So we would visit Titi and Aunt Lily a lot. Uh, Lorraine and her kids. I mean, well, Titi was kind of the, she was the fulcrum. So everybody went to Titi's house, yeah. no matter what, right? So, you know, holidays were spent going to Titi's a lot. Um, <clears throat> uh, though my parents would through great parties when I was a kid. So we would we would have, you know, my parents would throw a lot of, I, as I recall, they threw a fair amount of parties. Uh, one of the legendary ones, uh, they threw a luau and, uh, you know, the Hawaiian theme. My mother made uh, a dress and a shirt for my dad. I, shucks, I don't know what happened to that shirt, but I wore it as an adult for many, many years. <laughs> wow. Yeah, she, she yeah. mentioned that party to me. Oh, uh, man, it was the bomb. Yeah. My parents, no, they, they threw some really great parties. Um, and, you know, the things that we would do, you know, when my parents threw parties like that, you know, the kids would, you know, would be in our room in the back and the parents would, uh, would have a good old time and we would peek our heads out periodically to see what the adults were doing, which was generally speaking, you know, drinking, eating and dancing, you yeah. know, yeah. um, nothing to the extreme or at least not to my observation. Um, you know, it was just, you know, it's so funny to look back, you know, the years tend to be kind to the past, right? We don't remember the really dark stuff. But to be honest with you, there wasn't a lot of really dark stuff. Yeah. I mean, it, it happened around, but I had a pretty nice <laughs> upbringing. Yeah. Things didn't get really crazy until the 70s. That when the when the Bronx started burning, that was, listen, and I I said before, a lot of that had to do when when Co-op City was built, and the you know basically all of the economic and political power got sucked into Co-op City, and the rest of the Bronx was left to go to hell. Yeah. And I will never forgive city governments, and more important, less than the, the governments, but all of those real estate interests. Absolutely. As as an adult, you know. Um, knowing what I know now, if I could go back, um, let alone lawsuits, I probably would just, I would wind up arrested because I'd be beating the shit out of a lot of people for what they did to my people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and please forgive me for the use of language, oh, but it, it is, it. Yeah. <laughs> it's an, it's an outrage, the things that happened. And it happened because of malignant neglect. It wasn't an accident. If it was an accident, it would be something else. But no, this was the redlining thing. And, and <clears throat> redlining had a direct impact on my dad, who was a Korean War veteran. You know, if he could have leveraged the, the GI Bill for his own education and to get a house, our lives would have been completely different. Yeah, you know? absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. So let me pause there. Uh, uh, it, it, it's always, if I'm pausing, it's because I would like you to give me guidance because I can go sure. almost anywhere. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm very happy to, to do so. Um, so before we move forward to Co-op City and, and we'll definitely, um, you know, continue to touch on um, all of these larger themes with the Bronx as well. Um, but why don't you talk a little bit about your elementary school experience and what the public school that you went to was like, um, what sure. kind of students went there, how the teachers were, if you experienced any kind of racism. <laughs> or yeah. Okay. Went to PS41, uh, again, on Olinville Avenue. 
Uh, it was a very mixed school in terms of the students. Uh, you know, we had Italian, we had Black, we had Puerto Rican, we had Irish. Um, you know, basically the same representation of the neighborhood. Sure. Uh, the teachers were virtually all white. Yeah. Uh, I was in school during the teacher strikes of the 60s. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, you know, that's how D.P. started United Bronx Parents. I'm, you know, I know that that's part of the, the history. Um, sure. What I would say about my direct experience in the schools, uh, I had the best teacher of my life in the second grade. That would be Ms. Dorothy Beerfleet. Um, I, okay, so let me, so kindergarten was Miss Le, uh, Miss Levine. She pronounced it Levine, not Levine, because, okay. because, <sighs> because it was, you know, because racism and anti-Semitism went hand in hand and people sucked. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. but, uh, Miss Levine was very, very sweet. And as I recall, we even went to visit her at the end of the school year at her place. She lived, um, she lived in the neighborhood, uh, I guess, what would you call, I'm trying to think of what you would call the, the neighborhood, but it's, if you, if you're heading, uh, towards Van Cortlandt Park, okay. you, you know, you hit the end of, uh, you hit the end, you know, like near Clinton High School. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, so if the, that heading towards that neighborhood, she lived in that area. Anyway, okay. um, so uh, Miss Lubau was my first grade teacher. She was a sweetheart. Best teacher of my life was was Miss Beerfleet, um, who uh, was later Miss Walker. Miss um, Beerfleet was an amazing teacher, and to give you an idea of how amazing. <clears throat> Three children in her class, myself, Carol Sadlowitz, and another girl, Mary Mohika, all skipped from second to fourth grade. There are three other kids that were in my class that would have skipped with us, uh, but they were black and racist ass. Miss Levine was the uh, head of the teachers union in the school and she blocked those kids from coming in. She was my teacher in the fourth grade and you don't know how people or teachers are going to have an impact on your life in those moments. Yeah. So here I am, I'm this, you know, and please forgive me. I, I, I'm, this is not to toot my own horn, but I was really smart as a kid. Sure. I mean, really, really, really smart. I was reading by the time I was five, uh, and by the time I hit uh, second grade, you know, they had uh, the reading guidance was something called the SRA. This was a Stanford Research Assessment Tools. Mm -hmm. And basically, it was like color coded, uh, you know, reading materials so the kids could, you know, you know, they could figure out where you were. Well, I blazed through that stuff like nobody's business. Um, I was... I, I laugh because it, there's two things that I want to share about that. One is that uh, uh, an anecdote uh, about Miss Beerfleet. So uh, she told us this because we stayed in contact with her you know, for many years until she passed away. Um, so there was a student teacher who was going to have an observation. And the student teacher decided that they were going to do a, uh, a science piece. And Miss Beerfleet was like, listen, I don't know that you want to do a science piece with these kids. <laughs> and, you know, the, the student teacher was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll be able to do this. No problem whatsoever. But, well, she wasn't well prepared. And I depensed her in front of the principal. She left the room crying. <laughs> that, that happened. I mean, I, it wasn't that I intended to, but she had, I, is, I don't remember the exact details, but I think she had like three or four, like, you know, uh, poor pieces of information or whatever it was. But I was just like, no, that's not right. No, that's no, excuse me. I don't think that's correct. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's kind of the really good side. So I skipped from second to fourth. But the reason that I mentioned Miss, Miss Levine at all is because uh, Miss Levine, after the teacher strike was over, was telling the class how uh, you know, as I recall, she was asking the class what they thought. And I, I, in my innocence, said, well, you know, I think that the teacher shouldn't have got on a strike because it was hurting all of us kids. Yeah, yeah. You know, 
And, you know, and, and I'm sure that I said some things that were uh, a little bit more progressive in tone is what we would say today, yeah. liberal then. Uh, that exchange caused Miss Levine to hate me. Uh. And she was not shy about making my entire life in the fourth grade miserable wow. until I got moved out of the smart class because they, had, you know, there was tiered then and moved into the second class. And that adversely affected the arc of my education from that point through the rest of my life. Wow. wow. And, you know, there... I was about to say there's no forgiving that, but you know, I'm 61 years old, right? And so you can't carry that kind of stuff with you. Yeah. But I, I state very, very clearly that she hurt me for the rest of my life Absolutely. because of this. Absolutely. First of all, she didn't like the fact that there was a black kid in her class that was smarter than every fucking body else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I, shucks. When I was in, later on, just a, a quick anecdote, when I was in sixth grade, I never did homework because I didn't have to. Yeah. I passed every test with like a 95 or above because I'd read it and remember it. Sure, yeah. I didn't have a photographic memory. It wasn't like that, but I just, I just knew. But yeah, Miss, Miss Levine, she was bad. Yeah. And um, I think that the school system was then uh, ill-prepared to actually teach young people of color. Yeah. I think that that has made, been an issue ever since. And since I have a daughter who's now 26 and one who's now five or almost five, I can safely say that uh, there are systemic issues that are still a challenge. Uh, but getting back to, to the schools then, the last thing that I would say about PS41 was that it was a pre aside from uh, Miss Levine and also Miss Buxton was a horrible bitch. Oh my God, she was horrible. <laughs> no, and I please forgive, but she was a horrible person. Yeah. And there was another one. I, I think it was Miss Fox in the third grade that that was another one. There was just this wow. cadre of women who, I guess it you know, when you're a kid, you know, old is oh my God, you know they're in their thirties. These were yeah. probably women that were roughly speaking between 35 and 45. Okay, yeah. Right? Yeah. But uh, a significant percentage of them just did not want to educate the black kids and the Latino kids in the school. They just didn't, they didn't care. Sure. On the other hand, though, <sighs> kids didn't know and didn't care. We learned, <laughs> you know? And I, I, I still have a few friends from, from those days that I'm still in contact with that are, and we survived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in spite of their best efforts to, to mess you up, you. Uh, that, that's correct. But let me tell you, I mean, you know, I mentioned my friend Anthony Horn before, you know, he had a lot of issues because when we moved out of co-op, uh, Charlie stayed in the projects and had, uh, he was one of the kids that didn't, didn't get skipped with me. Uh, wound up going to Bronx Science, but you know because of the way things were, Charlie had that had a foot in both worlds. So he was part of the Black Spades, but also went to Bronx Science. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So there was uh, some of the, as I guess you would call them, pathologies, <laughs> wind up manifesting themselves in the strangest of ways. Uh, but Charlie's got like double masters and is an educator and he's uh, doing, doing okay, <laughs> you know, yeah. but uh, that would be despite of rather than because of uh, some of these teachers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so uh, before we move on to Co-op City, uh, this is a kind of another general question about um, your childhood. Why don't you talk about music, uh, the music your parents listened to? We had the best music in my house. Yeah, I'm sure. My, my folks, uh, my folks listened primarily to, uh, to jazz, Latin and, uh, and R and B. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. At, when I got a little bit older, you know, we mixed in some rock. My dad was never, never liked rock and roll. Uh, sure. and he also, when we we're in the car, sometimes would listen to like the WPAT, the easy listening station, which used to drive me crazy. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, in later years, I came to understand that was so he could calm down. Yeah. Right. Uh, dad had some anger management issues that were based on his experiences in, in Korea. 
Um, you know, I didn't find out until later that that was really, you know, PTSD. I found it much, much later that uh, dad was likely involved in some atrocities over there because he was he was ordered to do so and it was like you either did that or you were going to going to uh they were going to lock you up yeah for sure. or kill you in the field I oh mean, yeah for sure you know so uh dad carried some fairly sig significant anger but having said that um i'm sorry uh f refocus me again because I, I just got uh music ah yes um yeah so it, listen it was the 60s man <laughs> the best music Holy smoke. I mean, look, you know, the Motown era is coming up, you know, the Boogaloo era is coming up. So here's a, here's something for you. You talk about the, the crazy racism of this country. So Boogaloo was hugely popular. Yeah. But the record companies had no idea how to market it. So they didn't. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you had this music that was a combination of R&B and and what later became to be known as salsa, but, you know, like mambo music and, and, and Montuno. You had this mix that came out of basically the Bronx. Yeah. And it was amazing. It was no. amazing. You know, and that's not to mention the Beatles, because we listened to the Beatles in my house, too. Sure, sure, sure. We listen to everything in my house. I, I was very lucky that way. And it's very interesting. Uh, one quick aside there. One of the things that I always found very, very uh, deeply troubling and saddening was that in my house, we listened to everything. But if I went to a white friend's house, they never heard of Ray Barreto. Uh -huh. And if I, went to a, nor, if I went to a black friend's house, they never heard of Ray Barreto. Sure, sure. Right? Or Pipa Puente. And these people were, in my house, you know, Beretta was a legend and Pipa Puente was a legend, but so was Wes Montgomery and so were the Beatles. Yeah. And everybody was, everybody was in there. Yeah. But if I went to different friends, they weren't exposed to that. And so I was really, really lucky. My brother and I would listen to, well, my brother in particular, Tony's uh, uh, five and a half years older, uh, but we used to listen to radio shows like uh, Symphony Sid and Dick Ricardo Sugar at Night. And oh, these were the yeah. Latin music shows. Sure, sure. And, you know, so, you know, like, and they were on it, like, I suppose, like, you know, 10 o'clock to 10 to 12 or something like that, because they were like niche programming. Yeah. Uh, that's what we call it today. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so we listened to all kinds of music. Um, it was, yeah, it was really, it was a very special era in terms of music, because there was just so many different uh, cultures and things mixed all together. It was just, it was, it was wonderful. I mean, it was really, really wonderful. And, you know, it, to a large extent, it's still the music that I listen to today. Sure. Right? Sure. You know, I listen to music from the 60s and 70s when I'm, uh, if I'm out riding my bike or doing stuff like that, uh, I will listen to, uh, to Latin jazz of the 60s, Cal Jader and uh, Eddie Palmieri and things like that, because that's the music. That not only did it, I come up with that, but... You know, while we listened to some classical music in my house, classical music didn't have any soul. Sure, sure. And, when I, um, and you know, I'm not talking about uh, soul in terms of the, uh, you know, like R&B soul, but I found it to be uh, the rhythms to be academically oriented. They didn't move me here. I find I find the same same thing. As much as I've tried to appreciate it, it's always I just I listen to it and it just goes in one ear and out the other, and I can't relate. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it's, you know, technically it's lovely. I mean, it's, yeah. there's nothing wrong with it, but I, I couldn't tell you, you know, like, uh, you know, other than the big famous pieces, I couldn't tell you like Bach from Beethoven from Chopin. I just, yeah. I, I couldn't tell you. Um, but, you know, in our house, you know, like we had, you know, great respect for all musicians. You know, we listened to, uh, you know, uh, Duke Ellington and uh -huh. we, lis we listened to Mongo Santa Maria. We listened to uh, Wes Montgomery was big in my house. Um, who else? Um, later years, you know, is the uh, soul stuff, but like the, the temptations were huge in my house. Uh, got to see them live when I was a kid, but that's a little bit later, so we can shift that for the Co op City con conversation. Um, but yeah, music in my house was very, very important, very special, and uh, really eclectic and mixed. You know, there, there was no musical segregation in my house, and that absolutely was the case in many of the homes of friends of mine, you know, yeah. and, and again, you know, if I went to, you know, it didn't matter if I was going to like a white friend or a black friend, they didn't understand any of the Latin music. Yeah, yeah. They just yeah. didn't. For sure. You know? So, there you go. Which, which is a shame because there's so many 
so many jazz musicians who are deeply influenced by Latin music and vice versa and so much overlap between the two as far as the musicians go. So, yeah. Yeah. Listen, yeah. you know, Tito Puente played with everybody. Shucks, Tito Puente played on some of the first hip hop songs. People don't even know that. Yeah. You know, jo yeah. Joe Conzo will tell you the story because of his dad, but it's just like, yeah, you know, those folks, you know, they were musicians. They didn't care. Music yeah. doesn't have a color. Yeah, 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 you know? yeah. But anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I think, at least from, from my understanding, you started junior high at, at, uh, after you all already moved to Co-op City. Is that right? Or were you? Yes. Uh, uh, the transition, I was in the... Uh, fourth grade heading into fifth grade when we actually no i was actually heading into fifth grade when we moved okay, uh, that's sure. the summer of 69 so uh the 69 70 school year i was in fifth grade and from from september through april i was still at ps 41 and then when we moved uh when we moved let me think yeah as I, I was in, so that's, so it's fifth grade for that. Uh, right. So, so in 1970 in April, when we moved, they opened a uh, IS 180 okay, uh, sure. in the shopping center in, in uh, shopping center number one in co-op city. And so that's when, uh, that's when I was, you know, heading into middle school. Okay. Yeah. 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 And, and you, you talked about, you know, in general terms about, being in Co-op City, one of the first families in Co-op City. Um, uh, but why don't you you share a little bit more about what moving to um, moving to a place like that was like uh, in in your you know nine ten year old. It was amazing. You know, yeah. first of all, everything was brand new. Yeah. Right. Um, and there was in the early years of Co-op City, there was a very real sense of unity. Sure. Um, you know. Uh, there were, you know, uh, 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 ethnic and, uh, you know, some ethnic and socioeconomic uh, stratification issues, but like, you know, it was really, it was wonderful overall, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, there were some challenges, uh, but it was very, very nice. I mean, first of all, it was like, you know, to be growing up in a place where everything's under construction when you're a little kid, it's like, I just wandered around, you know, like, no, I wasn't one of the kids that went into many of the buildings on the construction, but like some of that adventure did happen. Sure. Uh, you know, just wandering around, you know, the swamp areas between, you know, sand everywhere, et cetera, et cetera. But no, Co-op City itself, I mean, you know, brand new, huge apartments. We had two bathrooms in my, in, in, in our apartment. Yeah. And my, my mom's still in the same place, sure. right? Sure. And all these yeah. years later. And so, you know, that apartment was like, wow, look at the size of this place. You know, yeah. we actually had a dishwasher. And my mother will tell you that I, as a kid, I said, now that we have a dishwasher, I'll never, I will always put the dishes away. Yeah, I lied about that. Um, but yeah, uh, no, it was, that was really, it was quite remarkable. Um, and there was a real sense of community. Uh, Co-op City at the time was probably, it was roughly speaking, 40 to demographically, it was probably 40 to 50 percent Jewish at the time. Sure. Uh, hold on a second. Sure. Hi, Mom. I'm in the midst of my Bronx Historical Society interview. Oh, okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi there. Okay, talk later. okay, I love you, Mom. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Yeah, you can call Kim's phone, okay? I oh, okay. And she's probably getting the kid dressed, but she's there. Okay, love you. So, there's my mom. <laughs> yeah, so every night we do this, uh, we do a Zoom with, so she can see Q, because, listen, you know, quick aside there, yeah, I can't tell you how much more life was added to my mom's life uh, in terms of years, but uh, Q's arrival has added a huge amount of life to whatever years my mom has still mom's yeah. 88 and you know i'm hoping for another forever because yeah. she's really amazing any any time she 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 spoke about q when when i was with her her face would just light up so much um dude, dude. yeah i mean i can't 
yeah, I'm the luckiest man in the world. I always say the same thing. Um, and the biggest, the biggest blessing of, of, of Q's life, aside from her being my daughter and me and Kim, it's the fact that, you know, she brings so much joy to my mom in particular. Yeah. You know, she's just, she's, the kid's just filled with life and joy. And I'm, I'm really, really lucky that way. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, back to, uh, co-op city in those days. Um, my group of friends was very, very mixed. Um, you know, I, this is one of the things that I, I, I started to say early because of my experience in gun help projects. When we moved to co-op city, you know, it was, you know, I had a lot of Jewish friends and a lot of, uh, you know, Jewish friends, um, Latino friends, black friends. Um, there weren't as many Irish in co-op at that time, sure, sure. Uh, nor as many Italians in co-op at that time. But like, it was like, it was kind of all us, we, yeah, yeah. you know, though I tended to be with a mixed crowd. There was, uh, there were definitely uh, groups of African-Americans that like hung out together tough. Sure. And there was, uh, you know, uh, particularly in 19, as I recall, like 1970, you know, uh, the teens that hung out in co-op city used to hang out in section one. My brother would know this stuff, uh, you know, it was like more my brother's generation. Yeah. Uh, that was that was problematic in certain ways because uh, it just, you know, sign of the times and a little bit wild. Um, but overall, um, my, my experiences in Co-op City as a kid were really, you know, especially early on, it was great. <laughs> you know, again, it was, a, it was a new place. And, you know, because everything was new, you know, there was a real, and there was a real sense of uh, overall unity and camaraderie. Uh, amongst the people there, uh, that started to get a little bit, uh, a little bit less so later on. You know, uh, when, when Section Five opened, that's when things got a little bit uh, crazier, because <laughs> Section Five wound up being the black section because, uh, because racism. Uh, what happened with Section Five? If if you recall, my family I mentioned was you know we were at the first meeting for the establishment of Co-op City sure. because we had those friends that were like union affiliated basically. Yeah. Um, so we were among the first applications. Um, by the time you got to section five, that's when the bulk of the African-American population that finally heard about it were able to get in oh, and right. it wound up being, you know, this segregated section, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, physically, cause it's, you know, it is set apart from the rest of co-op. So it's interesting. So like my white friends that moved into section five uh, became, you know, the minority within the minority, sure. which was like, yeah. what? <laughs> but that, but that was, that was very real. Um, I guess it's a little bit later, but one of the things that I do remember very clearly was that me and my friends, uh, particularly my friend Joe Greenwald and uh, Joey Levine uh, to an extent and uh, Neil Hoffman, all of whom are uh, fairly obviously Jewish. But well, we used to walk around during the, the holidays. Uh, this is a little bit later on, you know, like when I guess I would be like maybe like 13, 14 years old, but we used to walk around in the winter counting Christmas lights versus menorahs. And, you know, in those days, you know, it was like roughly speaking 50-50, but if you walk around Co-op City now in the holidays, uh, there are there. I saw exactly one menorah yeah. in co-op, and that was with uh, Stacy, who lives in my building. Yeah, it's just like you know, it, it's it's kind of wild that way. Yeah. Um, but again, I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna pause there and ask for guidance. What What do you want to know? Sure, sure. So, uh, both both when you were at living at Gun Hill and at Co-op City, when you'd go to other parts of the Bronx, um, did you know anyone in other parts of the Bronx aside from your family and, and, and people that your family was close with? Did you have any friends in other parts of the Bronx? Um, not as much, cause you know, look, I was a puppy, right? Um, yeah. You know, I had, you know, I'm trying to, th that's, a, that's a very interesting question. And the, the, in terms of close friends, not really. Sure, you know, sure. people were either, you know, co-op city or family, um, you know, and my, you know, friends from school were basically local folks until, you know, until much, much later on. Sure. Um, and did, did you spend much time in other neighborhoods aside from visiting your family? Um, do you have any other reason to go to other parts? Of uh, the riding my bike. 
yeah. you know, I was a, I was a bike rider, you know, so I used to ride through, you know, even, you know, when, when we moved to co-op city, you know, I used to ride my bike around, you know, I would, uh, I'd ride to the old neighborhood sometimes, you know, uh, you know, I would take like Gun Hill road or take Allerton Avenue or you know, just, just riding as far as Bronx park sometimes and back. Um, sometimes I would go to 33rd street, but that, that's more or less later. Sure. But uh, no, we were, because, you know, the, the challenge there was that Co-op City was so isolated, right? You couldn't get anywhere. Yeah. You, know, you couldn't walk anywhere. And if, you, if you're going to take a bus, yeah, I, I mean, I, other name, where would I go? You know, uh, I'd go to Fordham Road. I'd go to the movies at the RKO Fordham or the, uh, it was the Fordham and what was the other theaters? Two, two theaters over there. Uh, oh, the Paradise. The Paradise, yeah. Right. So I'd go up to go and go shopping, of course, at Alexander's and sure. things like that. Uh, when we we're looking for bargains, my dad would go to uh, corner distributors. I don't think that they're even there anymore. But yeah, you know, uh, but most of the, you know, most of uh, most of my time was spent in Co-op City at that point, just sure. you know, because of the isolation. And, and by the way, that isolation really you know, that re really hit home later on. You know, the counting of the Christmas lights was fun, you know, the, the first couple of years. But like, by the time we hit high school, my friends were like, if we're still here, I rem there was a leg legitimate conversation between me, Joe and Neil. If we're still here in, you know, 20 years, just kill me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, that was yeah, that was it, very real, it, and it's still still isolated. I mean, you know, there's bus lines that go out there, but they take a while to to get anywhere. But oh, <coughs> excuse me. Look, the express bus system in New York City exists because of co-ops, and don't let anyone tell you different. It was Edward Aragonian New York Bus Service that sure. started those. Uh, he started with a, a bus that went up to New Rochelle. Uh, and then the buses that were going down to, to Manhattan. Uh, they stopped the New Rochelle buses. I think it was for two reasons. Uh, I'm sure it was in part racism because always there's a factor there. But uh, according to uh, legend, at least, uh, the Bronx businesses were like, wait, you're, you're, if they go up to, if they're going to New Rochelle to shop, then, you know, that's taking business this is away from us and, or taking business away from us. And so therefore, um, but yeah, co-op city, because of the nature of the, the geography, et cetera, et cetera, it tended to make you stay home when you're a kid. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what about, um, Pelham Bay park, orchard beach, uh, city Island? Would you go out there very much growing up? Uh, not Pelham Bay park me. Um, but I used to ride my bike to Orchard Beach all the time. Sure. Yeah. All the time. I, and I, I, I still love that ride. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, I, I have on more than one occasion ridden from here in downtown Brooklyn uh, to uh, Orchard Beach just because. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. That, that's a pretty long ride, no? <laughs> yeah, it's a good ride. But listen, I, 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 would go, I would go there and then go visit mom and then, you know, ride home. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I love riding my bike. I'm sure my mom would have told you something like that. But yeah, I, so, uh, so Orchard Beach was big. Uh, Pelham Bay Park, less so. Sure. Um, and uh, you, you mentioned Bronx Park as well, or was it some, some uh, city location? Island. Oh, City Island. Uh, city Island was really only if we were going for food. Sure, sure. Because sure. uh, you know, just like Pelham Pelham Parkway, that was a that was a neighborhood that wasn't exactly welcoming for people of color. Absolutely. You know, unless you were going, if you were going to Sammy's Fish Box, <laughs> you're okay. Or Tony's yeah. down at the end, you're okay. Yeah. But like to to hang out, no, <laughs> just sure. no. For sure. Um, and what what about what about any of the other parks around the Bronx? I, you mentioned Bronx Park already, but. Um, did you ever hang out in any of any of the other parks around the Bronx? Not really. You know, when I when I was uh, in my teens and working in the South Bronx, you know, uh, People's Park and St. Mary's Park were kind of legendarily dangerous. Sure, you sure. know, so when I was going to work, you know, either at the daycare center or working at United Bronx Parents uh, main offices, uh, you know, I would occasionally go to, uh, you know, either, you know, take the kids to the playgrounds and stuff like that. But no, I wasn't going there because it was, it was dangerous. Sure, <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Absolutely. And I, I know you already mentioned um, uh, some of the gangs and, and, you know, you kind of 
you kind of missed uh, uh, the period in, in Gun Hill projects. They, there are a couple, of course, that sprung up after you already moved out. But did you have any run-ins with any of the gangs when you were, you know, say 12, 13? No, because... <laughs> all right, so first of all, and it's interesting because I'm in one of the one of the Bronx Facebook groups and there was somebody who apparently was doing research on gangs in, in the Bronx and he was asking there, did anybody know folks from uh, the Savage Skulls or the Black Spades or uh, what was, I mentioned the Jolly Stompers or the Decepticons. I never had trouble with any of those folks yeah, yeah. Uh, because I just stayed out of their way. I knew who the, who the trouble, trouble guys were. Yeah, they knew sure. who I was. Sure. Um, but I was like pretty much like I was a nerd, but I was I was a little too large for them to pick on, or they maybe they knew my brother in certain cases, or they knew who I was. Basically, I I got left alone. Nobody sure. ever really nobody messed with me, sure, right? Sure. And I, and also listen, I like my spidey senses would tingle. I'm like you know if you if you grow up, you know who's trouble. You know which kids are going to give you a hard time. Yeah. And yeah, I, I never really had any trouble with any of the gangs. Uh, several of my friends were involved with uh, the Savage Skulls. Uh, I seem to remember uh, Ronnie Morales is a name that came to mind, if only because he was mentioned as being one of the assholes in this. <laughs> uh, this is, it was actually, this is interesting, you know, a quick aside, because people's memories are very long. So this guy asked the question about, you know, the gangs there, and this woman you know, I think Ronnie Morales responded, and this woman responded, you were a bully and an asshole, and yada da 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 And this is 50 years later. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, people don't forget. Okay, so having said that, no, I never had any real trouble with any of those folks. Uh, you know, listen, I didn't have any trouble with anybody, really, in terms of real trouble. Uh, there were rivalries. Uh, there were certainly rivalries with kids that lived in the valley and there were certainly rivalries with kids that went to that lived in boston seacord that went to school with me at is 144 sure, right sure. michelangelo um kids in seacord were pretty wild i mean i remember that um and uh kids in the valley were, the valley was interesting because they like generally speaking those were you know like their parents were uh were property owners for the most, because you know the va the the valley is <clears throat> is you know it's all like you know private houses or row houses, right? Yeah. So, excuse me, the you know uh, there were rivalries there, but I, again, I never had it. Oh wait, I I left at Haffin Park. I used to go to Haffin Park in the in the in the valley sometimes. Okay. I used to play yeah. paddle ball there sometimes. Um, I didn't play too much hoops because I didn't play much basketball when I when I was that age. I was too much of a nerd and I didn't really jump high. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I used to go to Haffin Park sometimes. I used to ride my bike up and down that hill, which was, geez, that was a beast of a freaking hill, Hammersley Avenue. Um, still is a beast of a hill. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, let me see, is there any other things? Uh, no, that pretty much covers it there. Okay. Uh, um, guidance. And what about, um, why don't you talk a little bit about your time at uh, intermediate school uh, and then high school? Sure. Um, so uh, Michelangelo 144, uh, you know, that's at the, uh, the uh, you know, toward the bottom end of Gun Hill Road off of uh, Gunther Avenue. Um, that school is very mixed, uh, had pretty solid, you know, pretty solid education there, very mixed school. There was a, you know, you know, black, blacks, Latinos, uh, Italians, uh, Irish. It was a, a lot of uh, Italians there because of the, you know, uh, that was kind of the, the bottom end of the Pelham Parkway neighborhood. Okay. You know, because sure. the Pelham, basically, you know, that border was like Allerton Avenue and South, right? So anybody that was on that South side, you know, between Pelham uh, Pelham Parkway in Allerton, that section, I guess you, I, I would go as far as maybe not East Chester, maybe, yeah, probably East Chester and below is, was the, the feeder neighborhood for there. Sure. Um, uh, experience there was actually pretty good, had uh, some very good teachers there, some shitty teachers because that's the way it was. Yeah. Um, I, uh, 
I hesitate there because my second negative experience with the school system happened there. Okay. Uh, when I was in the sixth grade, uh, I had a great teacher in sixth grade, Mr. Calhoun, uh, my second best teacher. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> so I was put into the SP class. I was given a choice uh, to go into the uh, SP classes. They didn't allow me to go into the two-year SP uh, because uh, they said, because, well, we wouldn't want to uh, stult his emo emotional growth by putting him in with kids that are too old. Um, yeah, they never did that shit to white kids. I know, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, um, if I had been encouraged a different way, you know, shit, man, I, look, this is not looking back in anger, but without question, uh, the course of my academic career would have been very, very different if I could have been in a different class because, uh, frankly, I had a teacher who could not stand me. Because, mm. sure. again, this is one of those things. I was really smart, and I was very verbal, as you can probably tell. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there are some folks who are intimidated by that. And Miss Cantalis, who was my teacher... Uh, at that point, really took an extraordinary dislike to me, one that my classmates knew about. Yeah. This is, you know, many years later, I found out from classmates that they were like, we don't know why she gave you such a hard time. Yeah. You know, wow. and there was another one of my classmates, Howard Levine, who, who was getting the same shit from her, but Howard just like, he, he just like ducked. And yeah. I wasn't the kid that was going to duck. Yeah. For sure. You know, so I wound up getting tossed out of the SP classes. I wound up in the uh, in the uh, drama class, so to speak. You know, it was like semi-specialized. Um, but because I wasn't in the uh, that academic track, uh, I missed the uh, I missed the specialized high school test. I missed getting into Bronx Science by literally two points. Oh, they wow. said, "Well, Paul, if you want, if you go to summer school, you can go to Bronx Science." I'm like. Summer school? <laughs> nope. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Absolutely. How do, you, how do you ask a kid <laughs> to go to summer school so they can go to this school versus that school? Yeah, yeah. <sighs> what? Especially because that was going to be my last year at the, at the sleepaway camp that I was going to. Oh, okay, okay, sure. I was going yeah. to Camp Darkwaters, which is a section of my life that is actually really, really important. Uh, sure. Not Bronx-related, but, you know, sure. although... Uh, I found out about this camp because of folks that I knew from Gun Hill Projects. Okay, we'll, we'll definitely talk about that for sure then. Yeah, so I'm, so I'm being mindful of your time as well. So it's 7.57. I know that our window is quote unquote like closing, but I've got time. I'm good. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I, I have time too. And, you know, we'll, we'll record um, uh, at least two hours tonight if that's all right with you. And, um, and then I'm, I'm sure, very positive that we'll have to um, record another session if that's all right with you. Uh, of course, that's okay. At least another session. Um, but we'll, yeah, we'll see. Um, sure. Yes. Yeah. So, um, where were what were we talking about? We were talking about my experience first middle school. Okay. So, um, other than the you know those challenges, uh, experience at one forty four was was very good. Sure. Right. Um, I met uh, some of you know I, one of my best friends, uh, Lenny Underwood, who's a uh, a uh, keyboard player of some renown. Actually, we met when I was at uh, when I was at uh, at 144, and uh, yeah, my experiences at 144 are very good. Um, the you know there was a couple of not notable days that that would that may they sound ridiculous to me today, um, and they were ridiculous then, but they were also serious. So there there was a day where all of a sudden there was a huge police per presence in the area because uh, there had been, uh, somebody got jumped, a uh, black kid got jumped by kids uh, probably from the Pelham neighborhood. Oh, okay. But uh, when that happened, uh, there was a spontaneous, <laughs> excuse me, but I just have to say what it was called. There was a spontaneous uh, call for Kill Whitey Day. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. And so Kill Whitey Day, it was like cops everywhere. And like, listen, none of my friends knew any of this shit other than we heard about it. And it was like, well, that would be a bad thing. I think, you know, 
you know, but there were just cops every freaking where for that. And like nothing came out of it and there was never going to be any uh, out of it. But, you know, this was uh, at a time before there were school shootings and shit like that. You know, that, like, look, when, I will say this. When I was a kid, the worst thing that, that uh, you would hear about is that someone might have a knife. I never saw a knife in school. Yeah. You know, I never saw guns in school. Uh, I rarely saw any real serious fights. I mean, I knew that that stuff happened. Sure. But, you know, I don't want to say idyllic, but yeah, we we didn't really have those kinds of like rough times at 144. Yeah. You know, most of the rough times that, that, you know, that happened with the, you know, those gangs that we were talking about briefly before, you know, the Savage Skulls and that stuff, that was, that was kids being wannabes. Yeah. Right. One of the reasons that I never took the Savage Skulls and the Black Spades up in Cobb City seriously is that I knew the guys in the Ghetto Brothers downtown. Yeah. I knew Yellow Benji. OK, sure, sure. Yeah. And, and I mean, and let me tell you something, you know, brief aside there. Um, I knew Yellow Benji, who was uh, noted as the peacemaker sure. when OK. Benji was one of the sweetest, kindest people you would ever dream of meeting. Yeah, and he was close okay. with your aunt, right? Well, right, and so the and the reason for that is because when Black Benji was killed, and they called for the big peace conference, which is now legend, sure, sure. and um, fifty years ago, yeah, um, and so Benji went to my aunt. She went. He went to Titi for guidance, and she offered him space to be able to first it, it, it was the mental space to be able to you know negotiate the peace terms and she offered him a job on the spot wow and he wound up working for the united Bronx parents for years for years and he was just one of the kindest people you would ever want to know and so anyway <clears throat> the reason that i mentioned the ghetto brothers and those guys is like the gangs up in Co-op City, those guys were playing gangster. Yeah, 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 yeah. When I went to work down in the South Bronx where, the, you know, where there were blocks upon blocks of abandoned buildings and the gangs were real fucking gangs, man. Sure, sure. So I'd come up to Co-op City and I'd see these guys wearing the green trench coats and walking around like they're badasses. I'm like, you guys are pussies. <laughs> no, I'm not afraid of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you live you know, in a brand new cooperative high rise. <laughs> get the fuck out of here, man. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. And, 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 and let me be clear about this. It wasn't that I was looking for trouble. Sure. Um, and I wasn't the kind of person that was going to uh, get into confrontations with those guys, yeah. but they weren't going to get into a confrontation with me either. Yeah. And why? Because I was street smart enough to stay out of their way when they're acting the fool. Or large enough that if they were acting a fool, they weren't going to fuck with me. Yeah, 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 for sure. You know? And, uh, yeah. <laughs> that stuff is kind of funny and wild. All right, so let me pause there and ask for guidance. Which direction do you want to go? Yeah, yeah. So, um, when this this might be in your high school years. So, if, if it is, we can, we can touch on high school first. But when did you start um, uh, working at United Bronx Parents? Okay, yeah, so that was high school years. I was 14 years old, that's the summer of 1974. And uh, I guess that would be, I was entering my, I guess that's entering my freshman or sophomore year at Truman. So I was I was in the first full graduating tr- class at Truman High School. Oh, um, I, okay, sure. I, I graduated Truman in 1977. And uh, so I guess 73, 74 was my first, was my first year there and uh the summer of 74 i worked at the daycare center for united bronx parents okay Um, i worked with kids that were in uh i think my first class was kids that were like pre-k they were like probably like four years old maybe five years old something like that sure um i would get up in the morning take the take the subway walk over to baychester and you know and catch the five train down to uh down to uh usually i would i would take it either to interfail or to prospect depending the the school was like dead center in between uh intervale and prospect it was on the corner of 
actually it was the corner of uh, 163rd and Westchester. I mostly would go to Prospect because at that time uh, you get off at Intervale and it was like that, that was when the scary music would come on. That was like a block away from Fort Apache when Fort Apache was like really Fort Apache. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, no, I didn't, I didn't mess around in that neighborhood too much. Uh, but yeah, uh, those were the years that I was working at. Uh, I started working at, at UBP. Um, <clears throat> and that was, that was a very hard time, man, because the Bronx was literally burning. And, you know, I, I always tell people, if you looked at pictures of Dresden after the Allied bombings, sure. and you looked at pictures of the Bronx of the 70s, the housing stock is the same era. Yeah. If you have two black and white pictures, you could not tell the difference. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could not. And this is, this is important because uh, in Dresden, that was the result of the Allies bombing the shit out of that country. And the Bronx happened because greed, mm. because greed and racism going hand in hand. Absolutely. And, you know, we're living in a time where uh, there are some folks that don't like to talk about racism very, very much because it, it offends their sensibilities. <laughs> <laughs> you can't talk about those things, my poor children. <laughs> what if you tell them? <laughs> I want to punch people when I hear that stuff. Me too. I know. <laughs> because I'm like, hey, what about me when I was a kid? You yeah. motherfuckers didn't give a shit about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and you don't want to talk about what actually happened? You want to like make believe it didn't? Sugarcoat crap and yeah. So anyway, I, I, <laughs> so, um, so those years were very interesting because – me and my family were up in Co-op City. I used to work in the South Bronx, so I experienced the South Bronx directly, but also held it at distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I had friends that I worked with, and I had people that, you know, that I knew that were on Fox Street and Beck Street and in those neighborhoods and St. Mary's Park, et cetera, et cetera. But I still lived in Co-op City. Yeah. So, you know, like, I went to work down there, but... You know, that, that wasn't my lived life experience. And so if you, if you caught the, the article that David Gonzalez wrote, uh, I guess it's now a week and a half ago in the Times. David's a good friend of my family. Um, you know, my mom, as you know, is uh, La Madrina. And, and yeah. David really, really values my mom because it, she was one of the people, you know, who encouraged him to pursue his photojournalism. She told you know. Me. yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, but, you know, a part of David's article was talking about those days. And, you know, he talked very specifically about being, you know, his dad carrying him down the stairs from a fire. You know, I never had any experience like that. Sure. I, I mean, I just did. I'm, you know, so I'm very, very clear that, you know, among people that had lived life experiences that were very much darker than my own. Yeah. I witnessed their stuff, but I didn't, you know, you know, I wasn't living on Fox street then. Yeah. I was living up in co-op city. So it was like, I would, you know, I saw the stuff, but I didn't experience it. And I'm grateful for this. I mean, look, you know, I, I you know, in a certain way, I lived a very charmed life as far as that's concerned. Yeah. Um, I think that if uh, the one thing that I would like to share about that kind of dichotomy is that it gave me a perspective. I guess it's a, a perspective that stands to this day. Uh, I'm much more understanding of people of many different cultures and backgrounds because I had experience with everybody. Sure. And I, and you know, I carry that into my work today. I mean, like I, I can walk into the room with the CEO or I can walk into the room with the, uh, you know, the guys that's cleaning up. Yeah. And yeah. I can speak to both. Yeah. Frankly, I prefer talking to the guy that's cleaning up, but that's a part of that today is related to my own work uh, at Trader Joe's a few years ago. Uh, I, I worked at Trader Joe's for, for three or four years, starting at age 55 or six. Okay. Okay. Because yeah. You know, because because I needed a job sure. working in the nonprofit industry, especially in development, is a very crazy, crazy thing to do. Yeah. Uh, you're fundraising, so basically you're trying to convince people to give money for a good cause. Uh, and 
uh, many, many, many people that are in the nonprofit sector are either good at the mission or good at money and rare are those that can do both. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so that, uh, that was, <laughs> let's just say that that stuff was challenging, but you know, my original point is that because of my experiences, it has given me, uh, the ability to, to navigate, uh, multiple worlds. And I'm really, really grateful for that. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit more about your your time working at UBP? Um, you know, you can talk about uh, maybe things that you remember about Evelina or oh. the staff members or Lorraine or okay. So no, wait, stop. Time, right? <laughs> <laughs> Got to start with Titi. Uh, Titi was the rock for a community. She does not get anywhere near the recognition that she earned through her work. Absolutely. Nowhere near. Um, I'll give you a, I'll give you the anecdote that is most important to me in this context, because it shows who she was in a way that very few know. So I guess I was maybe, I, I don't remember which year this was, and if I if I were to ask him, he would know. But uh, there was a day that I was in Piti's office uh, down in, uh, I, this was uh, probably La Escuelita at this point. This was a PS 130. It was, you know, after they'd moved out of the uh, 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 791 prospect. Um, anyway, I'm in there one day, and two gentlemen came in to, to talk with her. And, you know, I said, Titi, do you want me to go? And she was like, no, you can stay. So I sat in the corner while she's talking with them. Uh, I can't remember who the other gentleman was, but one of them was Jose Serrano. Uh, okay, yeah, sure. And Jose Serrano and his compatriot had come down and they were asking Titi to run for office. Yeah. They were like, listen, we need you. We need you in office. We need you in office for all of the things that Titi had already done. You know, this was, you know, this was after, you know, with the establishment of UBP, you know, and creating the lunch program, the summer lunch program, and the, you know, all of these things that, that she had done by force of will, you know, she's or, or at this point already known as the hell lady of the Bronx. Yeah. <laughs> so Jose Serrano and, and his uh, compatriot come in and they're telling her, Titi, you got to run, you know, or Mrs. A, excuse me, Mrs. A, yeah. we want you to run because, and they gave her, you know, chapter and verse. <clears throat> she looked at him. And she said, no, yeah, this is your time. I need yeah. you to do this. Wow. And Titi told Jose Serrano to run for office, and he did. Yeah. And he served for 30 odd years or so, served our people really well, especially considering the crazy fucking world that we live in and a lot of people so-called progressives get on jump up and down on my last nerve today because people do not understand the difference between running for office advocacy and governance yeah, yeah, yeah. these are three very different things i've evolved into something that i call a pragmatic uh, pragmatic idealist my ideals are very very strong but i want to get things done Sure, sure, absolutely. So I don't have a lot of patience for people that are like, you know, like, oh, I don't like this because I'm like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I don't. I just don't. I don't. But so back to back to that story. The there are two things about Titi in, in that context that were, that were really really important. One, she never for a moment wavered from supporting the people of the community on the ground, yeah. and she never once for one moment hesitated on uplifting those who needed to be the next generation of leaders. And Titi literally gave her heart and life to the people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, shit. You know, I was, I, I was telling myself that I was not going to get too full because I tend to be a very uh, emotional person. I'm very filled with joy kind of person. Yeah. Um, I'm very, very lucky and blessed in a lot of ways. And so, I will always say to, to my Kimberly, you know, I'm a little bit full right now. Yeah. Um, so uh, <clears throat> I, 
before, uh, so let me tell you a little bit about my experiences, well, excuse me, before telling you a little bit about my experiences working down there, I want to say this about Diti. When Diti passed away, it was devastating for the community and for my family. It was a mess for my, on the personal level for the family. Uh, like it basically destroyed the family unit that I knew because Diti was the, was the fulcrum of everything for us. And, you know, me and my cousins, Donnie and Anita, we didn't speak for more than 20 years because of internal family shit. I don't know if my mom really talked about that. Um, but yeah, I, you know, it was a, uh, it was, it was something, but the more important reason I mentioned Titi's passing before talking about other things was that there were more than a hundred cars in the, uh, procession yeah. for her passing more than a hundred and the police gave an escort all around the Bronx before driving up to Westchester for her internment hmm. to see a line of cars that stretches as far as you can fucking see. Yeah. Okay. And this wasn't for this wasn't for some sports figure or this wasn't for DMX. You know, and I live in downtown Brooklyn, and I saw that procession for DMX. I mean, I saw it outside my window. Yeah. Okay. And God bless him. Okay. And this is not a knock on him. Sure. But they did that for my Titi. Yeah. Because she gave her life for the people of the community. Absolutely. Period. Absolutely. She gave her entire life for the people. Um, so, things that I remember about uh, UBP. One the most important thing about United Bronx Parents was that it created a sense of family and a sense of purpose for people that had been completely abandoned by the leadership of this city. Yeah, yeah. And she, <laughs> I mean, look, they created the first dual language school here. My, <laughs> my other aunt created the first bilingual program in the library system, right? You know, these are things that they just did. It wasn't like they were trying to become famous for it and they didn't become famous for it, sure. but they changed the way this country operates Absolutely. and nobody knows. Absolutely. I know. I know. And nobody knows, you know, um, Titi, she diffused more wars on the streets. She gave jobs to people that in certain cases probably didn't deserve it. Yeah, yeah. You know, whatever deserve means in the context, right? But she gave people the opportunity to live with dignity. Absolutely. And she helped any and everybody that came through the door. Absolutely. Um, my direct experience working uh, first in the daycare center was, you know, it was great. You know, we had all the, look, the, the buildings are burning all around, but kids are kids. Yeah, yeah. You know? We would take them, uh, we would, on, on trips, we would go up to uh, uh, what was then Mohantic State Park, which is now FDR Park. Sure. <laughs> Quick aside, uh, my family was one of the first, probably maybe 10 families that went to Mohantic State Park. We went the first day it opened. <laughs> and I can assure you that the reason that so many people of color went up there was because my family went first. Yeah, yeah. And we yeah. talked, and, and UBP used to take the kids during the summertime up there to go to the pools and things like that. Okay, sure, yeah. So yeah. That, that flow was rela related directly to my family. Wow, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and the, you know, that's not something that people would necessarily know, but yeah, that's facts. Um, another thing about working then i you know working the daycare center was was interesting working the after school program was also interesting for the same reasons because you know again you know between you know roughly speaking 74 and 80 81 82 83 as my last year working there was i think in 83 over those you know like nine years or so uh the bronx was going through all kinds of shit yeah, you know that it, it was somewhere in the middle of that was uh, Howard Cosell doing the the ball game and the Bronx is burning. Sure, sure, yeah. right. Um, but people lived lives, right? Absolutely, good, bad, and indifferent, and survived. And this is one of the things that David mentioned in his article. It's like you know, you know, he wasn't so sure about that resilience thing, but we fucking survived. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, um, Absolutely. I think the most important thing about 
uh, to remember about United Bronx parents um, was that there, there were not education advocacy organizations of that type before then. There's yeah. you know hundreds, if not thousands, of them now. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they they that, didn't that exist. It. That was they it. Did, time. Yeah, that 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 was it. Um, and I would also say, as a quick aside, uh, did they never fucked around with Sebco and the Gigantes because she knew they were mob and fucked those guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. and here's here's a quick aside on this. So, I this this is where life is completely insane, and this is a non sequitur to an extent, but it's something that you should know. So I was riding my bike one day on the west side. This is uh, probably about three years ago, maybe, maybe four. But I'm riding my bike. I take er very, very early morning bike rides. And I ran into an older fellow who was on an e-bike. And we just started chatting. Yeah. And he says, yeah, I, I grew up in the Bronx, uh, South Bronx. I was a medic in you know in uh during the vietnam war and uh when i came back uh you know there was this opportunity for folks to buy property up in the bronx but they weren't able to to get it because you needed to have somebody who had a you know uh either a medical degree or military background in order to secure those loans right this is the, i'm talking in the way he talked sure 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 so this gentleman was a friend of louis gigantes and uh he secured the loans so they could buy those properties. Uh -huh. That's how the mob was able to get in without anybody knowing. Yeah. And this guy, because he was a doctor, it's like, look, I'm doing this and they're going to get these properties. And, you know, and he like was doing it as a public service. And because the Gigantes were friends and he understood that, like, look, this is the way you get shit done. Yeah. He wasn't like, he did it relatively speaking al altruistically sure. <laughs> you know but yeah there's there are stories that exist that no one has any idea about because I, I had no idea about that but when he was telling me the story and he was connecting all of the dots in all of the places that i knew everything around it yeah i was like oh this guy's not bullshit he's wow. yeah and, you know and i you know i wish i could remember his name christ but uh, in any case, back to back to the Bronx actual. Sure. Um, <clears throat> pardon. I think the most important uh, thing to recall about those years uh, was Deepi's attitude was not by any means necessary. It was by every means necessary. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, she worked with city uh city administrations she worked with uh folks that had less than savory reputations in certain places yeah uh, because that's what you had to do but her personal integrity on this was unquestioned like i said she she wouldn't mess around with those sebco people and they wouldn't mess around with her <laughs> think about <laughs> think about that yeah yeah the yeah. mob wouldn't fuck with titi <laughs> the mob would not fuck with Titi. And yeah, I said it just like that. Okay? Yeah. That's the kind of powerful person that she was. Wow. Um, when she started United Bronx Parents, it was first United Bronx Parents as the as the you know education advocacy organization. Then she started the daycare center, and the daycare center grew into, you know, uh ultimately serving uh you know all kinds of populations you know the you know folks that were you know recovering from drugs and later on when lorraine was running the organization she got into helping uh you know uh creating the women's shelter i don't know as much about the details there um quick note on lorraine may she rest in peace um lorraine lived in titi's uh shadow to an extent like you know, as her daughter and as my mom did, you know, to an extent as her sister. Yeah. Um, and Lorraine fought desperately to get out from there. You know, she did not want to run United Bronx Parents. She was just trying to create an independent life. And when UBP, uh, when Deepi passed away, she was basically forced into, you know, going back to, to help run the place. Um, Probably to, 
it certainly wasn't good for Lorraine. Yeah. Right. Not on, on a human level. Sure. Um, but she did it because, listen. Absolutely. And you know the quote, right? Yeah. We will not ever a- leave the Bronx. So I, I can't, I can't read that quote without crying because I hear Dee's voice saying it every time. Yeah. But her, her dedication to the people of the Bronx was unending. Um, it led Lorraine to do everything that she could, you know, and, you know, I'll, I'll go good, bad, and indifferent because, uh, Lorraine and Tita were very, very different in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, service runs in my family because of Titi. Yeah. Um, and, you know, my mom as well. Um, I am a service-oriented person. I certainly haven't made a whole shitload of money across my life, and I've had a work journey, not a career. Yeah. Um, but one thing that has been consistent is that I've always tried to help people, and that's because that's, that's, it's in my DNA. It's just, it's in my DNA. Um, last thing about uh, the UBP experiences. Um, there, the organization was mostly, mostly uh, Puerto Ricans, but it was blacks and Puerto Ricans, right? It was, it was us, the, 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 the you know, interestingly, the, the way that hip hop got marketed, you know, made, you know, the Puerto Ricans disappear because, you know, that's the structural racism that marketing does. It's like, oh, we don't know what to do with those Puerto Ricans. So eh, we're going to, here we go. Yeah. Right. But uh, it was mixed. And, you know, there were people like, I, I remember, I got, I can't remember Butch's last name. Butch was African-American. Uh, you know, I've talked about Yellow Benji before. You know, there was a bunch of folks that they were there. We, we all knew that the Bronx was burning around, but it was like we had, we had, you know, there was a generation of kids that had to be taken care of. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. and so that's what we did. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I hope that answers the question in whatever roundabout way that I hit. Oh, yeah, it de- definitely does. It definitely does. Um, so I'm sure that we'll circle back to... Um, I'm sure that we'll circle back to UBP and um, and your aunt some more throughout the course of things. Um, I, but I think I think maybe um, I will end on. Do you want to end this recording session on either high school or your sleepaway camp? I, I think maybe your sleepaway camp might have more you might have more to say about your sleepaway camp because it sounds like a pretty formative experience, <laughs> but. Oh gosh. Um, you know, I'll go with camp dark waters in this context because, yeah. uh, the, the experience of Truman high school, I think is, is worth starting, you know, the next conversation because, uh, for any number of reasons, but, uh, so camp dark waters was a, a Quaker camp in Medford, New Jersey. Uh, 08055 <laughs> zip code <laughs> South Jersey about 90 minutes from here um, we were introduced to it because there was uh, the Treason family lived in in uh, Gunhill projects with us uh, so it was um, the Treases introduced the Savlowitzes and the Levines to uh, to Camp Dark Waters the Levines introduced me and my family to it. I went there for the first time, uh, literally the weekend that we moved. Uh, we were supposed to move into co-op on June 23rd of 1969. They moved the official move date to the uh, the following week. Okay. And so I left for camp on the 27th, that Saturday. And so when I left for camp, we were in Gun Hill Projects. When I came back, we were in Co-op City. Wow. And my five years at Camp Dark Waters were absolutely formative. Uh, interestingly enough, um, uh, I have a core group of Facebook friends that are Dark Waters people, uh, many of whom who I have not seen since 1973. Wow. But th- there is a common sensibility yeah. that 
uh, that was engendered in those days. Uh, they launched for the moon on my birthday in 1969. That was July 16th. Wow. And uh, landed on the 20th. Uh, that was also summer of Woodstock. I was there. Uh, I was at Camp Dark Waters for four weeks that summer. But then uh, from 1970 through 73, every summer I was there for eight weeks. Uh, the sacrifice that my parents must have made so I could go to a summer camp like that, uh, the economic sacrifice must have been really serious that I didn't understand. Sure. But, you know... My parents saw how much I loved my friends from camp and the experience of walking around barefoot in the woods, you know, in, uh, you know, in Medford, New Jersey and, and going canoeing and, and camping in the Pine Barrens yeah. and, you know, being around, you know, kids that were from, you know, you know, from Philadelphia and Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and, you know, some kids from the Bronx, like just being around that, uh, that uh, very different environment was critical for me. Yeah. Um, what it allowed me to see was life could be very different, you know, especially, you know, <laughs> when I think back on it, uh, you know, to go to a place like Dark Waters and, you know, to come back in the Bronx is burning. I mean, that's really, it's really so far apart yeah. in terms of lived life experiences. Um, the biggest things that I remember about Dark Waters in this context, uh, you know, this is the, uh, this is late sixties, early seventies. Uh, so it was a very progressive place as you can imagine with Quakers. Uh, it was, uh, uh, it was decidedly non-Christian and non-Jewish because they were Quakers, but we had, uh, you know, the Quaker meeting every Sunday where, you know, like for 45 minutes, you had to sit quietly. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and you know, at best read a book, you know. Um, but that experience was just, it was, it was amazing. Yeah. It was amazing because, uh, because it allowed me to see that life could be different. Definitely. It really is simple as that. And the, you know, the people, you know, the, like I said, you know, I still have friends from those days. And, you, know, well, you know, Joey Levine and Carol Savlitz, who I mentioned earlier, they are my first two friends. I have no memories. I mean, literally, I don't have any memories of me that don't have Joey and Carol. <laughs> and, and we're still, we're still friends. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, Carol lives up in Westchester and uh, Joey up in the Boston area. Okay. Um, okay. Wow. But we're, you know, we're still friends, uh, you yeah. know, and we, we don't talk every day or anything like that. But listen, you know, uh, when we talk, it's like, it's like nothing, you know, time nor distance changes that relationship. Yeah. Um, and that's the way that I am with a lot of my Dark Waters people. Sure. Uh, it was a very unique time uh, that that allowed me to understand life from a very different perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of hesitating there because, you know, there's all kinds of experiences of, you know, like, you know, being a kid and running around and playing capture the flag or swamp stomping and things like that. But the individual uh, things like that aren't as important as the people. Sure, sure. And uh, I will say very, very clearly that I'm very lucky and blessed to have had the experiences of Go Hill Projects and Co-op City and Camp Dark Waters and working for United Bronx Parents in the South Bronx yeah. because those collective experiences have allowed me to evolve into a person that I am comfortable with now. Yeah. I was not comfortable with myself for many, many years. I told you it's work journey, not a career. Yeah. I did not finish college because of any number of reasons that related to the, you know, uh, my own reaction to the fucked up educational system. I'm not, you know, putting all of it on the system because it's like, you know, how do you respond to things, right? Yeah. And we have to build our uh, bounce back muscles in various ways. Uh, I can tell you that over the course of my adult life, uh, 
uh, I have always gotten up one more time than I got knocked down. Yeah, yeah. And I got knocked down plenty. Yeah. And there were plenty of times that I had no idea how I was going to get through. Um, and I, if I may, I'd like to wrap up with a brief anecdote that is not really uh, related to the Bronx directly, but is completely related to who I am as a human being. Sure. <clears throat> A couple of years ago, I was working for an organization called the Association of Black Foundation Executives. Uh, it's a professional organization that is designed to support exactly who I'm talking about, Black Foundation Executives. These are people that are, you know, middle, middle to upper management in the uh, nonprofit world. Uh, they are, you know, African-American by definition, uh, mission and definition. And uh, so I was working for that organization and there was a uh there was a conference that they had uh in new orleans uh, i'm giving you the condensed version of that because i want to get to the reason i'm mentioning this uh they had a convention down in new orleans where uh the president of the organization was uh asked said this said this uh made this statement she says you know there's been a lot of talk about uh about equity in our sector lately and you know, uh, I find that that talk very, very interesting. Uh, and let's see what happens. Let's see how that evolves. Yeah. And I'm condensing the story a bit. Um, and I was sitting there in the audience uh, after having uh, gotten like two hours sleep because I was writing a $250,000 grant on an idea that was my idea that my boss sat on for like months. And, but, you know, that's... <laughs> That's to give an idea of where my head was at. But when she said that, the room went silent for me because I was like, in my head, I was like, wait a minute, how in the world are you saying that we'll see? Isn't this the room of, filled with people that are supposed to make that happen? Yeah. And so I sat there for another 20 minutes during the, the end of the, till the end of the presentation and I was just stewing and I was just stewing and I was just stewing. And at the end, there's this like moment of quiet in my head. And it was, and it was, um, speak now or forever hold your peace, essentially. Yeah. Right. And so I'm not a religious guy, but in my head, I was like, you know, God, what do you want me to do? Yeah. And instead of hearing the Morgan Freeman voicing, oh, this is what you should do. <laughs> Uh, I heard a deafening silence. Yeah. And in that deafening silence, I was like, okay. And I raised my hand and I said to her, I was like, Susan, with all due respect, um, isn't this the room full of people that is supposed to make that manifest? Isn't, aren't we the people supposed to make that happen? Yeah. Uh, I don't remember what her answer was exactly, but I can tell you that, uh, that was viewed as insubordination and I was summarily fired on the spot. Wow. Um, that's not the important part of the story. The important part of the story is I got back to New York and I had just lost a job that was paying the bulk of my family's bills. Yeah. Uh, I was still working in Trader Joe's at the time. I, I, <laughs> My daughter had just been born. I worked two jobs, minimum 10 hours a day for 10 weeks, mm -hmm. seven days a week. Wow. Seven. Okay. I mean, it was, I, I was either working or sleeping. Yeah. That, that was my life. So the reason that I tell, say all of that is for this moment in time. And this is, gets back to uh, the, who I am. So there was one day uh, I had taken a bike ride, uh, as is my one to do. I, I ride in the middle of the night um, and I was coming home from my ride at six o'clock in the morning. And I'm at the, there's a pier on Canal Street uh, on the west side. And I went out to the end of that pier and I'm just sitting there, me and my bike. And I had a talk with God. I had to let go and let God because I had nothing. I had, I had, I had nothing left. I had nothing left. I was like, God, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. I don't know. 
I need, I need you to guide me forward. You know, and I'm not a religious dude, I told you. I, I don't even call myself Catholic, even though I was baptized, because I'm like, uh, it's me and God. I mean, anything else is, is construct of man. Yeah. That's my personal opinion. I'm not knocking anybody else's faith, but this is where I am. Sure. And so uh, in that deafening silence, the same kind of deafening silence, I was waiting for the Morgan Freeman voice, bro. I was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and like, God, what do you want me to do? And I had this deafening silence. And in that moment, I said to myself, it doesn't matter what I do, but I will do. Yeah. And I will keep getting up. And if I get knocked down, I will get up again. And if I get down, I will get up again and again and again and again and again. Yeah. That comes directly from Titi, Aunt Lily, and my mom. I love my dad, but it was those women yeah. who created that sense of resilience. And no, I am not going to stay knocked down. I'm going to get up and I'm going to do whatever I can to live the best possible life that I can. Yeah. And that's, that's the man that you're talking to now. Doesn't mean that I'm perfect because I am not, as my Kimberly, she'll tell you. <laughs> Um, you know, I've got plenty of challenges, but I have learned a couple of things across my 61 years now. And the most important one is that you keep moving. Yeah. You just keep moving forward. Yeah. So with that, it's wow. 840 and my daughter's got to go to sleep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this, this first part has been incredible. And I really appreciate you sharing everything you've shared. And um, I'll look forward to recording the second part. I'll, I'll get in touch with you um, and we'll schedule that through email and all. I'm going yeah. to yeah. stop the recording. It won't end the call yet. But